Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when or where are you watching us or listening to us. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Material Business Podcast. I'm Monica Hernandez, your host, and I have a very special guest, Michael Perez. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me, Monica. Thank, thank you for having me on the show, Monica. It's, honest, it's an honest pleasure. It is really nice to have you. And we're going to talk a lot about things from another perspective. I know our, our audience always is, you know, striving to hear people that have common struggles. However, some of those common struggles we don't really talk about. And I am very, very grateful to you for accepting the invite and coming into the podcast and share some of your stories and some of the learnings that you have had through your life. Because a lot of the guys that will be listening to this, I'm sure they will correlate and it will give per perspective to all the girls that are going to be listening to that. So we're going to touch base on all those points, mental health, how this having balance within harmony and what you're doing brings you the best self uh, and all those interesting points from your point of view. Yeah, Amazing. I, I, yeah I, I very, very much agree. and. You know, although I, you know, I might be male here, but um, growing up, uh, I had a litany of learning disabilities. In particular, I had ADHD, and I was diagnosed with the strongest diagnosis for for Ritalin. I think it was 120 milligrams of slow release Ritalin. And the point I'm making here is, even very early on in my in my childhood, I always felt like I functioned differently and I behaved differently than those around me. And I know that we're all different but something felt fundamentally different than how I function. And it took me quite a few years to come around and learn to embrace that and realize that it's a unique advantage. So sometimes even being a minority, whether it feels like a disadvantage, I think can give you unique leverage in whatever industry you might be in. And I'm happy to expand on that specific point in just a moment. But you know, I first want to take a little bit of a step back and kind of uh, introduce myself. So, uh, so just my name is Michael Perez, and uh, I've been engaged in the entrepreneurship space for quite some time. I have a background in software engineering and journalism, and I have a deep underlying passion for understanding human aging. So I currently have graduated in computer science and mathematics. I'm currently pursuing a degree in biomedical engineering. And um, I've also authored a book called The Road Less Traveled, which particularly discusses my childhood and how I kind of broke into the entrepreneur space, um, which allows me to segue into the point I was just making prior, where I had, you know, I had a whole bunch of learning disabilities. I had to go to like a private tutor when it came to math. I had to go to a private tutor when it came to English. I remember every morning I had to take my riddle in right, like right by the hallways where all my classmates were walking by. So I kind of felt from an identity perspective, I was labeled as different early on. And it took me years. And I wish I had really grasped or capitalized on this notion earlier that being different to some capacity, to whatever capacity, was extremely leverageable. And in mm -hmm. fact, coming into the playing field with such a disadvantage, because not only did I have learning disabilities, but I also grew up in an extremely orthodox Jewish environment, and I wasn't given the fundamentals or the tools to really navigate outside of that system. So when I graduated from high school, I could barely do algebra. Um, yeah. And I always dumped into calculus one. And that can seem overwhelming to many people. But in fact, it was like an epiphany or a revelation where I realized how much someone can do in such a short period of time when that's the only thing that matters. So, you know, it, it, and, and to, to kind of uh, dig a little deeper into how I felt different, um, the school, and I got no critique on the schooling system, but when you, but when you're in elementary school and when you're in high school, you're fundamentally rewarded for the things that I wasn't organized, being articulate, coming on time, focusing specifically on the content matter, not necessarily being innovative or creative. You weren't fundamentally rewarded for innovation. You were rewarded for, 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 for being rigid and following instructions. And I always felt like, even when I would ask questions, I always felt like I was annoying the people around me. You know, I was asking about extreme conditions. I wanted to understand something better. I, you know, I always tried to dig a little deeper and it was almost felt unnecessary or needless. And at some point, I started realizing, and it took a very specific moment in high school, where I asked a question in math class, 
and I was told to be quiet because it wasn't needed. And I mm. kind of felt like I understood something they didn't. And that's why I was asking the question. And then I realized, you know, the masses don't necessarily dictate what's right or wrong. And, mm. I, and I started to realize something. And it was a very tiny feeling, but it was a feeling that was fundamental that I built on up until today. And it really started, I believe, at that point. It was almost like a, a, a moment of realization where whatever I feel in me that I feel that is different, that I feel the need to ask, that's the, my most precious asset. And it might not be appreciated today, but it's something to build on. So you can be, for example, a female in a male dominated industry where your voices are not necessarily, you know, sometimes you're almost seen as different. You might even feel it as challenging. But that fundamentally, and if you can th think deep down of how you can leverage that uniqueness factor, that can give you an incredible advantage of whatever playing field you're in. So, you know, just to come back to my specific point here, um, and I don't, I don't mean to make a, a super long monologue, but coming back to my specific point here, you know, going through math and sorry, going through my algebra in such a short period of time was a certain, was overwhelming. It was overwhelming. I couldn't tell you how many hours I put into studying. And if, coincidentally, my tutor at the time, I wasn't going to class. I was getting like, I had like a guy who I reached out to who was 17, who was younger than me. And he knew everything. He knew Cal 1, Cal 2. He got private school. He knew electricity and magnetism. He understood how Cal 3 connected to physics. And it really was like, whoa, this guy is like light years ahead of me. But it was also inspirational. Okay. And, and I gave up everything. Like I really did. I gave up my friends. I gave up going out, but I spent nothing but months studying. And that feeling of progress, that rate of change, that delta in my life of, in terms of knowledge has become an addiction, really. And it was almost seen as the worst point in my life where I was completely lost, where people might give up. They'd be like, this is crazy. You know? And you can totally play the victim card. I have learning disabilities. I have a hard time concentrating. Um, it's not my fault. I got a poor education. It's impossible for me to kind of cross this bridge over. And it would have been entirely justifiable to play that victim card. But at the same time, I realized I've got nothing to lose. And in fact, I really want it. And I brute forced my way through the process. And that became a, kind of like a, a, a catapult into everything I do today, which we're going to get into in just a moment. But I kind of just wanted to start the conversation with that foundation, because I do feel like that's a big part of my identity as someone who really didn't have the tools to properly navigate his life forward. And the hardest moments in the silver lining were the actual best moments, were the moments that I leveraged up until today. Wow. Thank you for being so vulnerable. It's, um, I don't think we embrace vulnerability in the way we should. Uh, and that is, that is because when we, in my opinion, when we see something that is different, we label it as a bad thing, like you said, instead of embracing it and seeing what can this teach me so I can be better. So you have touched in incredible points. Um, like focusing on what you wanted to achieve, not passing on responsibility to anyone, really taking on the reins of what you wanted. And then look at where that has brought you today. So it's an inspiration that brought you to even more deeper and deeper and like going from not being able to do algebra and then having degrees in science and then pursuing all those things, being a, a successful entrepreneur and all those things. You're right. Maybe perhaps what we are focusing on are not skills that are going to help our youngers in life itself. So right. it is... Uh, it's a self-discovery, like we were saying. Uh, and then in your case, I think it's brought you to blossom. Right. I, I, I fundamentally agree with that. And it's like, generally, like it's, you know, even taking gender or, you know, a, a, any of that, taking all that out in general, when you're within a system, a social construct, deviating slightly is somewhat accepted, but something monumental, something much deeper than that is rejected almost as a knee jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. But sometimes um, when that rejection is touching upon something that you very deep down inside, and sometimes it's conscious and sometimes it's not, it's subconscious. But when, it, when that infringes upon something deep down that you hold dear, that you see as valuable, that you see as a core part of your identity, to me, that's a sign that you have an incredible uniqueness factor. And that's what it is. And you need to leverage that in whatever capacity it is. So, yes, I, I, I definitely agree. 
So I guess one of the the points that I'm hearing is instead of asking ourselves why is this happening to me or like playing the victim like you were saying is discover that one thing that makes you unique and then really explode that into you know it's like a plant when you're putting a lot of good earth and then a lot of love and water and all that to that one plant that is going to blossom into something bigger and better and it's just giving that time for your true self to discover the identity that you want to be. Right. And and honestly, no one else will make that decision for you. And it's not about justification. It's not about what's reasonable. You can easily play a victim card in life and say that, hey, listen, these are the cards I've been dealt with. It's, you know, it's not my fault. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to a very simple calculation. We all want success. We all want, and, and, and our definition of success, might I say, is constantly changing. I don't necessarily feel like I've achieved success. In fact, my goal for success is always just out of reach. And my definition for success today should change my definition of success tomorrow. But you know, to make my point here, um, it, it, we all want success. We all want to live a good life. We all want to achieve happiness. The real That's not a valuable question because that is a common denominator no matter who you ask. What's a valuable question is, is what are you willing to give up to get it? Mm-hmm. So I, I appreciate that, you know, we want to be successful in some capacity, but ask yourself, are you willing to give up your 12 year eight hours of sleep? Mm-hmm. Are you willing to move back into your parents' home for six months so you can save enough money so you can course correct in your life to get into that direction? Are you willing to give up going out with your friends every Saturday night and, you know, or weekends and having fun and partying um, to pursue this, this goal of success? And these are very simple questions. Mm-hmm. And that's where it comes down in life. The people who kind of pursue the right direction tell them, yeah, I am willing to give up this stuff. In fact, I've got a larger frame. So like if we're aiming for the shortest form of gratification, it's right in reach, right in front of us. But the ones who want true happiness, it usually takes years to develop the sort of skill set to bring yourself into the feeling. And it's not necessarily about making money. It's about developing the skills that can make money. It's about being able to, if someone were to just give you $10 million, you might be super excited, but there'd still be a certain deep sense of emptiness you haven't fulfilled. You didn't actually earn that, right? And developing the skills that allow you to compete in an environment where you can earn that money, that's where the real success happens from. So to make this really simple, what are you willing to give up to get it? That's a question we should all ask ourselves. That's a really good question. I read one time in one whiteboard in a meeting room that I entered, it said, for every yes that you give, what are you saying no to? Yeah. Uh, so it's it comes down to, to that. So it's very interesting because when we normally have those changing, like life-changing questions, sometimes uh, we are very young, like in your case. Um, and sometimes we are in life pushes us to take decisions because whatever happens, uh, maybe we lose a job or maybe we immigrate to a different country. So we are in a complete different scenario. And often is we are pushed to think outside of our comfort zone. And I am asking myself, how is that with you? How, how, what is your experience with that? Like being pushing yourself outside of that comfort zone, and how is that? Like you do a million things at the same time, and you have the capacity to do it. You have built it. You were born with uh, some gift, but you built upon that to be who you are right now. But how is that pushing out of the comfort zone something that you can leverage? On? Yeah, that's an absolutely wonderful question. And there's so much to unpack in that question. So I'll try to stay as focused as possible here, but my ADD might get the best of me. Um, So first and foremost, um, we're in, you know, if I were to take a step back here and discuss, you know, if you were looking for a good job 20, 30 years ago, you would look at, you know, what kind of engineer pays the best, what kind of doctor pays the best, you would pursue academia, you do three, five years of school, and you'd get a job and focus in a very narrow vertical. I think a lot of that is it hasn't really adjusted. Our, our pursuit for education really hasn't adjusted to the 
quick changes of our environment, given certain variables like technology and the rapid pace and growth of technology. So we're in a place where something like COVID acts as like, uh, uh, it, 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 it's almost acts as a, as a catalyst and it, it helps us realize how if we don't have malleable and adaptable skill sets, it becomes really hard for us to find comfort and security in such a fast changing environment. And again, COVID felt like a stress test for that. It helped us realize, oh, wow, you know, my skill set is really dependent on a very specific set of conditions. So first and foremost, you know, we're in a virtual environment. We are heading towards a virtual environment. This isn't necessarily advice for everyone, but for those who are starting their journey, you want to kind of pick a set of skills that has that can be applied to many environments and can have a wide range of applications. And you also want to diversify your skills. You don't want to be too dependent on one specific skill set. So, you know, for example, like learning how to play with zeros and ones, being a programmer, learning how IT works or learning how cybersecurity works. This is a, a set of skills that you can apply to many domains. You can enter the gaming industry, you can enter the web development industry, you can enter all sorts of media work. You can you can work for pretty much any discipline remotely. So not only can you work anywhere in the world, but the specific skills you have can be applied to a wide range of applications. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and to answer your, your question on, on, you know, I said I do a whole lot, you want to make sure that you don't do a whole lot of nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's a very careful science because uh, I think what's the famous saying? It's a, a, a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Okay. And it keeps going on, you know, you, you, but anyways, the, the point here is, um, I try to operate under an 80-20 uh, philosophy when how I work. So I'm constantly oscillating between doing 20% R&D, like research and development, 80% with my specific core skill set, with my specific clientele, and then I reach into a place where I flip. And then I'll do 80 per, and it's, it's not as long. When I'm in this 80% of the time where I'm doing R&D and 20% I'm maintaining the base I have, um, that I'm not in that phase for too long, but that's a very like school mode, educational sense. And I'm always trying to master what I do, but then to always see what I can do to inch outwards. And it's that thirst for learning and not necessarily just making money. And it harps back to the specific point I made just when we started this conversation. It's mm -hmm. that feeling of change I got at school in those three, four months that really fundamentally shifted how I saw the world. And whenever I wake up in the morning and I'm not feeling like, oh, today I really use my brain. Yesterday, I really used my brain. I, I've really kind of inched outwards or, you know, I, I feel like I'm progressing. I'm developing a new set of skills. Whenever I feel like I'm doing a lot of patternized and repetitive work for too long, I realize I'm getting stagnant. Mm -hmm. and, and complacency is the death of us all. So that's when I know it's time for me to do a shift, but I'm always seeing what can I push in in out, inch outwards. So, you know, I'm in, uh, I'm a programmer, you know, what can I do just slightly outwards? Oh, I can do web design. Let me master that skill. Oh, I can do data communication. I can build servers and do networking. That's another skill. So, you know, I'm constantly inching outwards and then I kind of find a way to kind of, kind of put these things together and then I can offer a more unique set of skills to my to my clientele. Being in the journal, journalism or content writing industry and being in the software development industry is a fairly unique, um, it's not very common for someone to, to kind of focus mm -hmm. on those two aspects. And just for a specific example, that gives me a very unique perspective in the publication building industry. So one of our startups is called Scale My Publication. We build news publications. You can be the best web developer, but if you don't understand the nuances of the news industry, it's hard for you to really navigate it at the level we're navigating at and vice versa. Oh, so nice. it's really easy to it's really easy to trace the steps back, but it is hard when you're doing two things that seem independent to realize and be confident that these things will connect in the future. But they always, always, always do. And the secret to building that confidence, to be willing to pursue something for two, three months when you're not extremely clear about what the return is going to be, is to find that success in smaller points. So mm -hmm. to find it in, in very tiny areas, even within your specific job set and building it outwards and extrapolating outwards. And this is how people, you know, it's kind of like the saying where the more money you make, the easier it becomes to make money. And you're seeing that a little bit in America when you look at the economy and a little unfortunate where you have a dying middle class. So you're seeing, you know, you're seeing the people at the top and then the people at the bottom, and then they're being pushed away from each other. And mm -hmm. it's really hard for someone down here to cross over to here. Not, it's definitely possible, but it's becoming harder and harder and harder. And, you know, it, it's, it's, 
it's a, but, but once the people on the way on the top have figured out how to do it once, it becomes so much easier to do it twice and three times. And like I would like to, and the point I'm trying to make here is making your first million, making your first 200,000 is exponentially harder than making your next 200,000, than making your next 400,000. And you really have to be willing to give up a lot when you're down there to figure out a unique set of skills. It's constant. You constantly want to assess what is my uniqueness factor? What separates me from other people and triple down on them? That's a very interesting, you know, I have, I've heard John Maxwell, for example, saying, concentrate in the things that you are strong at. And it's completely the opposite, for example, in education, uh, if you're not good at math and you're good at arts, uh, they'll put you in classes, math classes, not art classes. Uh, so it's... Uh, Cultivating what you are good at makes you de discover that uniqueness. So he says something like, "You are, uh, you are un like special, unique is the the word that he uses. Yeah. So find your special uniqueness, and like you said, for people fortunate enough to be niche of a niche or the minority of the minority, then we, we have it in front of us. So it is how we can leverage on that and I guess take it to our advantage uh, right. to make it progress. Right. So, well, I, and... I guess, go ahead. Sorry to cut you off. No, you can go ahead. I just wanted to, to, to ask you, how was that moment when you discover you wanted to, to uh, be blind and then say, hey, I do have HDHD and it's okay. And I have a different set of skills, but I will going to use them. How did that play in your mind? Great, great question. Great question. Okay. Just before I answer that specific question, I want to go back and just elaborate on one point you made about, um, about how, uh, you know, like when you're in a specific um, uh, workforce, um, a lot of times, it, it, in order, you're talking about that uniqueness factor, a lot of times, the monumental shifts in any domain are done by completely outside thinking. And mm -hmm. you see this all the time, even in academia. If you look at Albert Einstein, his major contributions, all his four, uh, his, 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 um, his four major papers, his four major comp contributions, photoelectric effect, um, and, you know, all four of them were all done very early on in his career. Um, and a lot of times when you're told to think a certain way, you can find incremental growth in your, in, in your environment, but something monumental for some, you require extremely unique thinking. And a lot of times you need creativity outside of that domain to leverage within it. So, you know, if, if, you know, and, and there was once a show I was watching and, and, I, and I know this is funny, but there's a show called Rick and Morty. It's one of my favorite shows. And it's a cartoon show. It's a little bit of a cynical show, but it's it's a beautiful show about a you know grandfather's got a very different personality than his grandson. But you know, there's one passive comment he made in there that really shook me. He said, "Morty, sometimes science is more art than science," mm -hmm. and that's extremely true. So mm -hmm. you know, you can love art and you can still pursue science. You can, and and in fact, if you do find a way to work within the framework of science, but you have an artistic mind. That'll give you some very unique perspectives that are your colleagues Charter. around you might not. So I just wanted um, to make that point. And then now back to the, to the ADHD. Yeah. It was more of a gradation. It wasn't necessarily an aha moment. But what I've quickly noticed is the tools that I was told by people who I respected, my parents and my, you know, my professors of how to function in life quickly became obvious to me that they weren't the best tools for me as an individual. They might be mm -hmm. true for other people, but they weren't true for me. Going to class didn't work for me. I learned how to study a notes and reverse engineer the course and spend much less time and hone in on, you know, a good professor would make their syllabus reflect their exams. They would, when they, when they do write notes and they make similar examples with nuanced differences, they're trying to express a very subtle point and not having to go to class and operate at everyone else's pace or way of thinking with all the other noise and questions that might not necessarily be valuable for me. I was able to hone in on exactly what gave me value for my time. So right. I mean, that might be completely contrary opinion, contrary advice to what a professor might give you, but that's somehow what worked for me. And I've noticed that this sort of theme played itself out all the time. 
ADHD, you know, you're told to focus on a specific task to get things done. Makes sense. I do really well. I've kind of learned how to master. I didn't fight my ADHD, but I've leveraged it to my advantage. And I've learned how to do multiple things at the same time. Because, you know, if my mind would drift away, I would let it. But I would let it drift away into another area that's constructive. So uh -huh. I might code for 20 minutes, respond to emails for 20 minutes, watch a documentary for 20 minutes, have the documentary continue playing while I finish my code. And this way I stay excited. And this way I'm not fighting what's natural to me, but I'm leveraging it to my advantage. And in fact, I can focus very, very well in this framework and I can be very high functioning and I can have a high level of output, um, but it might not necessarily be within the framework that other people who don't have ADHD might recommend. So I guess to answer your question and, and in a more broad and relatable sense, um, it's important to constantly be aggressive about f optimizing your own efficiency mm -hmm. and you should be able to listen to advice from other people. But don't necessarily take it as the gospel and the word of God. Absorb that information. And within your lens of life, assess that information, whether it's valuable for you or not. But the secret, the, the most important secret here is, is to never get too comfortable with life. It's always that, you know, like people look at stress as like, uh, you know, it's an, in a way, there's a reason why we get stressed out, right? We've evolved to be stressed out when we need to. It's an, it's an, it helps us existentially. It, yeah. might, mm -hmm. it might have helped us in wild in the wild to react to an environment that might be detrimental to our to our to our um, to our existence. Um, you know, if we're in a dangerous environment where there are bears and whatnot, we would get stressed out, we would get anxiety as a response to leave that area. But in the same capacity, it applies to how it works in this world, where stress in a way is a signal that we need to adjust we, and, and, and we don't want to ignore that stress and you don't want to get too comfortable. Even if you have a good paying job, the biggest and, and, and biggest catastrophe that can happen to us is when we are very comfortable with where we are mm -hmm. and we have a good paying job in a nice bureaucratic system. It doesn't necessarily fulfill our dreams, but, and I would look at it as like, we're, we're paid enough to be willing to forget about our own personal dreams and pursue yeah. someone else's. And that is a trap. You've got good benefits, you've got you know all you want, but you're in a cubicle calibrating a GPS for the rest of your life. And to me, that's the that's a prison that you're not you don't even realize you're in. And if you're happy, listen, if you're happy doing that, and if you're fundamentally happily doing that, that is great. I'm not going to question that. And I'm not telling you that my philosophy in life is better than anyone else's. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying is my philosophy in life, I feel, has helped me become happier and feel a stronger sense of fulfillment. And if you're missing that fulfillment, um, and even if you're getting paid well and you have a comfortable situation, you have to want to remove some of that comfort temporarily so you can kind of pursue something that'll give you a deeper sense of fulfillment and that circles back to my point of how much do you want that sense of happiness and what are you willing to give up to get it yeah exactly that how much do you want it when you were making your your description there was a uh I watched a movie with my son, you know, he's 11. So we watched the avatars and all those, all those films that 11 year olds watch and he gets super excited. And then here comes Hulk. And then we all remember Hulk with like green is mush, is mush. And then just, right. you know, a very, very irrational kind of throwing everything. And, and then the last one that I don't even recall the name of the film. I not I don't know good uh, nam names of films and all that. But when we were watching it, then there is this Hulk that is dressed up, and then uh, everyone is like, "Oh, what happened?" And he said, "Well, I instead of fighting with him, I made friends with him, and now we work together. And now he was, you know, still Hulk." like green and big uh, but he was kind and instead of bursting in anger he was able to enter the lab and work like the scientist that was inside him was so he kind of met that point that what you were saying is like how can i get this wow superpower that i have and make it work for me in a way that works for me and it might not work for everyone else, but for me it does. And so I just wanted to to picture you the idea that I had in my mind when you were describing it. So beautiful. And you are in a place that you feel that fulfillment. So I understand well, that 
you feel that you don't feel the success because your target is always moving as it should. That is what keeps you motivated and you want to pursue more things, but it gets you the, the moments of happiness that we like to have. I agree. I always like to be the, I always like to feel like the smallest person in the room, but I know that I am making some progress because I can quickly assess my goals a year ago or nothing that impresses me today. Mm -hmm. So that to me makes me feel like, okay, hey, you know, you are making progress, but I definitely feel the pressure to always do better. I definitely never feel like I've made it in life or anywhere near. I feel like I've just begun my journey, um, but I guess that's how it always should feel. Um, and it is. I, I mean, my company is called Infinity Growth, right? And so when I named my company, uh, everyone was like, you're crazy. Like an engineering company called Infinity Growth. What is that? It right. should be something, something consultant or engineers associated, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, whatever is mine. So I was just going to go with it. And <laughs> I really go with that idea that I truly believe, Michael, that we come to this earth to learn. There is no right or wrong. It's just decisions right. and learnings. And you're only wrong if you repeat it over and over, which because life is going to present it to you over and over until you learn the lesson, right? So I guess this, this is just a beautiful confirmation that even if you don't feel that you belong, there is a lot of great things within you that will propel you to excel in whatever you're doing. You only have to discover it. Right. A hundred percent. And, and, you know, some, and then on a personal level, it's a decision you have to make. If you're in a company and they truly don't appreciate you and they don't recognize your skill set, especially for superficial reasons like your gender or where you're from, or, you know, even where you might've went to school, um, then that's a decision you need to make on your own. But what I would say is if you love what you're doing, you definitely shouldn't give that up because of other pr pressures from the outside. And I think that ultimately you're the one who determines whether you should, whether, you know, you're the one who's in charge of your decisions that ultimately make you happy. So sometimes as dark as it may seem, persisting areas that, they, that you know, you might, and fighting that external pressure sure. eventually, eventually will bear fruit. So, um, you know, don't give in to something that makes you much less happy because of external pressures. That's, and I know that's a little abstract, but I guess that's, you know, relatable to each oh. other on a personal level. Right. And we, we hear it over and over. Don't settle down. Right. And we hear it a lot in personal relationships is don't settle down for less that you deserve. Right. And, and don't settle. Well, it's the same with jobs and with areas of work. And the decision might seem, like you said, you Perhaps you don't see clear where are you going, but it's definitely better than where you were stuck. Right. So right. it is a discovery journey. And hey, it's just what happens if it doesn't work? Nothing happens. It's not like I'm asking you to chop up your arm. Right. It's like, yeah, go back or do something different. Like in your case, I love that you have done a lot of other things. And then that is what happens. For example, in my case, uh, I work in, in engineering and leadership and I'm a mom and I have, you know, I'm, I have a, several hats, which being an entrepreneur, you know very well how that works. And being successful at performing all those tasks at the time you have to do it is just becoming at how can I organize, like you said, how can I organize my day? that works for me to my growth and I contribute and I feel happy at the end of today. Right. hundred percent. And, and, you know, sometimes you might have to give up a lot if you've got a very comfortable job, but understand that when you move the frame to 10 years to a decade from now, it's way more expensive to stay in your job than it is to move back in your parents and develop, let's just say you're working in a company and you're a manager for, for a fast food chain and, you know, happy, for whatever reason, it doesn't make you happy, but you were in there for a long time and your salary is pretty good. But, you know, if you're willing to move back in with your parents and develop the skills of a graphic designer or whatever it may be and pursue something that you're deeply passionate about, you know, say be art, um, 
you know, just think of where you see yourself in 10 years from now or where you hope to. And the idea of being stuck in a job you don't love for 10 years because it never made sense for you to leave at any particular moment can lead to some really pretty big sadness. And I think that I think that sometimes making some deep changes now and taking huge steps back in your life and even hurting your image of someone, like let's just say it's a little embarrassing, you're 35 or 36 and you're moving back home with your parents, that's okay. It's not a big deal. And in fact, if you can bring your survival costs down to zero as much as possible, if you have food and you don't have to pay for rent, um, that's the most beautiful thing because you have the world at your fingertips. You can literally learn any skill set you want online. And if you can design your life where you just give yourself six months, not a very long, not a very large amount of time, six months to develop a new set of skills that can help you for the rest of your life. To me, sometimes that is something you should, like, that's something you should always consider. Um, so yeah, you know, um, don't be scared to take big steps in life. As long as you're learning and you're making this thing a little better, um, that's, you know, you, you might not necessarily understand its application now, but it always falls into place later. Totally, totally, totally. It's um, it's an ever evolving, I guess, process. Life itself, right? It is right. how. And I, I really loved something that you said is the set, the skill set that I have. I have to constantly look at it, give it feedback, and evaluate and see if I want to do something different. And that totally aligns to what we have been saying in the podcast with all the the people, especially women, that come and say, okay, now I am a mom. I'm a new mom. So I have to do many other things that I didn't do before. Uh, and how well that's where your evaluation of yourself, uh, you take that in, in, into with you and then you say okay i need to be this or that to become this or that how do i do it so how right. what are those like tools like mini tools you said okay for example managing time it's it's important uh in your day life what are some other tools that work for you and that you've discovered that is helping the process well, that's a good question. So, um, first of all, I'm mean, we're getting a little bit specific here, but some software tools that I'm very much passionate about using that help communication that allow me to scale. So, what I've noticed is like hiring five or six or seven people is very different than hiring ten or twenty people. Like the anything that's not highly optimal, you might not necessarily see it in a smaller sense when you're dealing with one or two people, but those inefficiencies become compounded as you grow better. So. I mean, to get specific, like organization tools like Slack, organization tools like like um, like Notion is incredibly essential. Um, having taking care of the mind. Is, so I fast personally, I fast 18 hours a day. I only eat six hours. Um, that really helps my mind. I know that sounds a little like less like a time management thing, but it really is. It helps me go throughout my entire day. I don't eat processed sugar. Um, mm -hmm. and these things seem really hard at first. And now, like I said, it's much less expensive than eating processed sugar. And my whole life is totally. completely upshifted. It's been almost eight, nine months now. Um, running all the time, running at least once a day is super important for me. Um, no matter how my day goes, I at least got to get a mile in or else it just becomes it's just it's just everything is just less fun and less motivated. Um Creating protocols and SOPs. So every time we teach new tasks within our companies, we have to work. So instead of me explaining it to a single person, I would put it in an SOP. And, and over time, I would have each person that I hire for the job go back and revise the SOP and make it more optimal. So if I go through the same task with four or five different project managers, I will want to get their own unique perspective to optimize it each and every time. Um, so these are like small stuff that you develop over time. Um, hiring is a very complex process. So that's something that I can talk about for a million hours. Um, uh -huh. But yeah, you, you kind of like, you've, you, you know, you find you just, you have these like rules for every specific area and you just constantly refine those over time and you don't get too stuck on a specific set of criteria. Um, yeah. I want uh, to touch base with um, probably the last five or so people that have come to the podcast, they all have that time for themselves. And it was funny because 
I've, like middle of that, I, I took a yoga class, which I'm not a yogi by any means, but I started doing yoga because I realized some time ago, if you don't take care of your body, your body is going to make you listen to it. And right. in, a, in a really bad way, right? So yeah. I, and and, and Monica, like, what's it all about? Like, why do you work hard so you can make exactly. money and live a good life? When exactly. you don't feel good. Exactly. Yeah. And then at some point you feel like uh, being like, I value health more, like a thousand times more than life. Because if you die, you die. But if you're in bed and you can't move because you're ill, and but your mind's still working, it's a prison and it's really, really bad. So And all, and all the money you made can't help you. At all. And you can't do anything for everything that we always say what is important to us. If you ask anyone in the, if I take this mic and go outside and I ask people that go by the street, what is important for you? Family, my son, my kids, my wife, my, well, if you're sick, sorry, none of that happens. Right. I agree. So, and and so it's not only with you, but really with what you are saying that is important for you. So self-care is an absolute necessity. And in, in some ways, I don't know how many years ago, probably uh, people started to say it's a luxury and it's absolutely not. It's a necessity. And if you don't make it your priority, healing will become your priority. And that's three times harder. Right. Reactive is way more work than being proactive. And, and I would even argue that to, to add to what you're saying, it's all directly connected. The same discipline you get with running every morning, the same discipline you have with fasting is the same discipline you want to develop when you're working. It's, totally. it's, it's really like on an abstract layer, they're one of the same thing and they translate down the chain differently. Um, and in fact, that's why I get like motivated when I see people who commit to the gym, who take incredibly good care of their body and they work out every day, no matter how their day goes. And they're all, you know, built and jacked. Uh, those are people that you, you want to kind of learn more about their insights. They might, sometimes they're only super focused with fitness and, you know, everything else is kind of weird, but, but what you want to do is learn how they think because there's lessons in there that you can take for your own life. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, um, it's very important. So uh, like time has flown so fast. We have, we are almost at the end, Michael, I really appreciate everything that you've said. I think is very valuable. Uh, I don't think we have these conversations often. And then yeah. in an industry that we, I think we normalized um, working really, really hard and then going over our body needs. It's uh, hearing some perspective from outside. It's always very helpful. So I thank you very much for for coming and sharing your stories. Uh, and then for everything that you do, it's amazing. Yeah, Monica, if I can, if I can ask you a quick question. So for sure. where were you originally from? Colombia. Right. And when you moved, you moved to Canada, correct? Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit of how it was like for you once you moved to a completely new country with a different value system, a different way of thinking? Um, and how, you know, what were the biggest struggles you felt when trying to adapt? Um. You know, I always, my necessity or not my necessity, but my wanting to go out of Colombia, I went uh, with work. I went in work in Dominican Republic and I work with people from all over the world. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is what I want to do. So I went back to Colombia and then I, there was the Canadian government uh, requesting for engineers in metallurgical, which is my degree. Uh, so I went and did the process and I landed at my, I was 25 when I landed in Quebec and I didn't, I knew nobody. And uh, I thought I was, I learned French because I went to the French Academy for, you know, a couple of months and well, not couple, it was like a year. I got all my levels of French. So I thought, oh my God, je parle français. Uh, and then when I arrived to Quebec, oh gosh, that was really um, 
a wake up call because uh, nobody understood me at all. So it was very interesting. C'est une vraiment différent français en Québec que le reste du monde, ouais. Vraiment. And just for that, yeah. see, I'm from Montreal too, so. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, That's why I we're. Understand. Yeah. yeah. Well, my French is very rusty because I don't speak it as often anymore. But um, yeah. So being in a new country, it was like, oh wow, this is amazing, and they have all those new, nice, you know, roads and things that I don't have back in Colombia. And but then the struggles started to validate my diploma, for example and learning the language and making community um, because I landed by myself and I didn't have anyone. So I thought I was rich because I put all my money in Colombia when I was working Interesting. because that would be my money to live here. And I was like, oh my God, I'm rich. And when I got here, I didn't have a credit card. I didn't have credit, like, you know, credit. Nobody knows me. And they rented me an apartment and they requested uh, four months in advance. And oh, wow. all my money went away. <laughs> so I sat down there. I was like, oh, gosh, I don't have That's more money. What am I going to do? So it's, it's um, you know, it pushes you to find ways. Right. So right. before I... coming, before coming, I started, uh, you know, hairdressing. So, because I said, maybe it will help me in the first days or something. And uh, I, I did. Uh, it helped me. I started putting, you know, little pamphlets, hairdress for $20. So I had something to eat for that week or something. So it was very, it wasn't easy. Um, sure. But it was a lot of learning. And I discovered a lot of things that I have, a lot of strengths. Uh, and it gave me the power i guess to understand that i can yeah and just one more short question here looking back how did um what do you feel is the the best quality that you've learned from that process that you feel like you would have never learned otherwise from immigration and the whole process of moving to a new country and you know have no not having money having to adapt being desperate or concerned that you know you're running out of cash Flexibility. Well, that, that's the second one. I think the best one or the first one is believing that I can do it. Mm. Uh, undoubtedly. Like I've always believed in myself and that's one of the, one of my qualities is I don't search for external validation because I believe a lot on me. Um, but at that time, there is so many things that go against you that at some point you you're kind of thinking did i did i mess it up or am i am i doing the right thing or should right. i what what role should i go but i always had that something that told me inside of me go for it beautiful that's a beautiful story thank you for sharing yeah, that yeah well thank you for asking me it's nice to have guests that ask me questions <laughs> turn the table a little bit <laughs> right yeah. it's nice it's nice well do you have any last message for our audience Um, you know, this pretty much is just wake up every day, look at yourself in the mirror and ask if you're doing the same thing over and over. And if you don't feel a sense of fulfillment, do something radical. It's that simple. And, uh, you know, worry about it now so you can live happy in the future. That's, that's my parting words. Thank you, Michael. It's been a Thank super you. pleasure having you. It's, uh, it's amazing. And I hope we can continue same here. collaborating together. Thank you for your time, Monica. Bye-bye. Thank you.